Sri Lanka Bimanya, Honorable Karu Jai Surya, the former Chief Justice, Honorable Asoka Di Silva, the Chairperson of the Human Rights Commission, Justice Rohini Marasingha, President's Council, Mr. Sarah Jayaman, Your Excellencies of the Diplomatic Corps, Representatives of Development Partners, the Commander of the Sri Lanka Air Force, Representatives of the Commander of the Sri Lanka Navy and the Inspector General of Police, distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen. The incidents of 2022 are still fresh in our minds. The agitations or the aragale of last year gave rise to numerous outcomes, some obvious and others subtle. As a serving judicial officer, it would be wholly inappropriate for me to comment on the root causes, the process, and the legality or otherwise of the manifestations of the Aragale, its merits and outcomes. Associated with Aragale, we witness the rising of many debates in our society. Some arose due to multiple challenges that Sri Lanka as a democratic nation need to grapple with. One such debate centered around the absence or the lack of consensus in our community of what a lawful arrest is as opposed to a protest which is either unlawful or illegal. In other words, the question as to what protests are permitted by law and what are not. The other debate focused on the responses or reactions by the police and the armed forces towards protests. What actions of the police and the armed forces were lawful and what are not. I do not, ladies and gentlemen, propose to deal with or comment on any specific protest or response thereto. However, it is my view that addressing you on some of the applicable legal principles would be appropriate. In a functioning democracy, protests are not uncommon. Protests are, in fact, very natural. The state and her people can have divergent views. Groups of people may also have divergent views among them. People may want to openly express their opposition to certain policies and practices of the state. In fact, the existence of peaceful protests can be identified as a feature of a truly functioning democracy and a free society. Protests can give rise to changes of state policy. Some changes so carried out by the state may in fact be in public interest. Certain socio-political scientists may even go to the extent of saying that protests, insofar as they do not transgress the law, should be encouraged. To protest without infringing the law is a right that people have. It stems from certain fundamental rights recognized by our Constitution. To me, a protest is an external manifestation of a group of persons jointly exercising the fundamental right to freedom of speech and expression and the freedoms of peaceful assembly and association, coupled with political activism with one or more political or other goals. It originates from our 
inalienable fundamental right to freedom of thought and conscience. It is, ladies and gentlemen, in public and national interest that people are permitted to jointly and individually exercise their fundamental and democratic rights in the nature of participating in lawful protests without, of course, violating the law. Ladies and gentlemen, the problem arises out of not all protests being alike. Some protests start off peacefully and end in the same peaceful manner. Some start off peacefully, but in the process of the protest, the protest itself turns into violence with offences being committed. Then, of course, there are protests which start off illegally in an unlawful manner and continue to be unlawful. There are, of course, peaceful protests to which different groups of persons with various collateral motives may join to scuttle the peaceful nature of that protest. That is why defining a protest to be either legal or illegal is a challenging task. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, you will observe that the legal complexion of a protest can be threefold. Lawful protest on the one hand and unlawful protest on the other hand. The third category being a combination of both. In my view, it is the rule of law that sits between lawful and unlawful protests. A lawful protest is a protest that does not entail any illegal activity. An unlawful or illegal protest is a protest that is associated with transgressions of the law. That is where law enforcement has a role to play. If there are transgressions of the law, committing of offences and the unleashing of violence, the rule of law demands that the police bring the situation under control and enforce the law with regard to incidents which amount to the committing of offences. It would also be in public interest for the police to take necessary action to prevent violations of the law. If there exists an imminent likelihood of violence being perpetrated, necessary action must be taken to prevent a breach of the peace and transgressions of the law. We cannot, ladies and gentlemen, overlook the ground reality of certain circumstances which arise during protests necessitating the use of some degree of force. I would be hesitant to classify that degree of force as being reasonable force because of its subjective nature. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, the police, possibly aided by the armed forces in situations where the armed forces have been mobilized in a lawful manner, must respond to the outbreak of violence as well as situations where there exists a realistic and imminent likelihood of violence erupting. However, as a lawful protest is a legitimate form of exercising fundamental rights, the right to freedom of expression and free speech, and peaceful assembly and freedom of association, the responses of the police must be strategized to interdict only illegal activity while permitting what is lawful. The police and the armed forces must 
respond in terms of the law without reacting. The responses of the police and the armed forces must be carried out within the framework of the law as prescribed by the law and in a manner not exceeding the authority conferred on them by the law. The responses of the authorities must not only be lawful in the strict sense of the word, but must also be necessary in the circumstances and carried out in good faith in a manner that is proportionate to the harm that is being caused or is likely to be caused. The responses, ladies and gentlemen, by the police and armed forces should not take the form of punitive action in the nature of immediately punishing those who transgress the law. The responses of the police, unless unavoidable, should not result in causing any form of physical or psychological harm to even those who violate the law. Actions against the perpetrators of violence must necessarily be carried out in a manner that is lawful, while going to the extent of upholding the fundamental rights of even those who violate the law. What is the golden thread, as I see, which surrounds the legal principles that govern the response of the police and the armed forces is that the action must be lawful, carried out in good faith, and not be orchestrated by political motives towards the suppression of lawful protest or suppression of other forms of dissent which are expressed through lawful means. Towards that end of ensuring that the responses of the police and the armed forces in respect of even unlawful protests are necessarily lawful in accordance with the rule of law and does not infringe fundamental rights of the citizens, I believe the guidelines that have been developed by the Human Rights Commission would be extremely useful. I regret, ladies and gentlemen, my not being in a position to comment about the individual provisions of the guidelines because it is quite likely that the guidelines when sought to be enforced would be challenged in our court. Be that as it may, I am, I am encouraged by the fact that the chairperson of the Human Rights Commission in her address did say that from tomorrow onwards, these recommended guidelines will be made open to the public for inclusive consultations with the general public and stakeholders. We must not allow these guidelines to remain recommended guidelines. In a country such as Sri Lanka, it is important that important legal principles contained in these guidelines be converted into enforceable rules. And therefore, I earnestly hope that once the guidelines are finalized, that it would be transmitted to the Inspector General of Police, who could consider promulgating these guidelines by converting them into rules in terms of Section 55 of the Police Order. In that manner, these rules will be enforceable and it would be legally obligatory on the part of law enforcement officers to adhere to the provisions contained in these guidelines. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen, while congratulating the Human Rights Commission. Thank you.